Okay, well, it was uh, an amazing morning. We have uh, some interesting things that are going to happen. And in the meantime, I'm going to try and tell you about some things that I care about. And um, something I've, 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 I've failed to talk about for a long time, but I've had to talk about this subject recently because of some important events that have happened. Uh, so far on this advanced study weekend, you've heard from Dr. Gilbert Welch about early detection and uh, the fact that early detection is of questionable benefit. Did you all hear that from Dr. Welch? Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're kind of clear that early detection may not be the way to go. And I've been talking about early detection for many years, and I've been studying the research that Dr. Welch has been studying. We had Dr. Peter Gertzke here in November, who's head of the Cochrane Collaboration. And the Cochrane Collaboration says that we should stop recommending mammography. I mean, the Cochrane Collaboration is the, the most respected organization in the world. And right here on this stage, the head of the Cochrane Collaboration told folks that they should not get mammograms and mammography should no longer be recommended and the Cochrane Collaboration put out a brochure in 2012 in 13 languages that told people to stop getting mammograms. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force in 2010 said you should stop teaching breast self-examination. PSA testing, digital rectal examination, unanimously by all organizations, those types of testing for finding cancer are condemned. It's pretty universal. <coughs> So they say, maybe you should get a colon exam. I actually reviewed all this. I reviewed all this stuff about early detection. I remember, I'm a doctor. I'm a general doctor. I want to help people, my patients, as much as I can. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the wash water. I want you to have every advantage, but I don't want you to get hurt. And so I've been studying cancer, quote, the prevention of cancer, which is early detection isn't the prevention, is it? That just finds more cancer. I've been studying these issues of uh, early detection, cancer cause, and cancer treatment for a long time. I would say I'm pretty much an expert on this, as much as you can get. Let me just kind of review for you my conclusions on screening early detection testing. <clears throat> it can be of some help. Well, it's not just my opinion. Uh, the US Preventative Services Task Force has weighed in. Uh, it's a little hard to read, but let me just tell you what uh, the general recommendations are. That early detection using breast self-examination should not be done. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says that. I think Canadian Preventative Services Task Force said that since 2001. Pretty much everybody says you shouldn't be checking your breasts for breast cancer, that it does more harm than good. You say, well, what harm could it do? Well, you worry about it, you find lumps, you've got to go to the doctor, you get surgeries, etc. It doesn't prolong life. In terms of mammograms, I don't recommend it. U.S. Preventative Services Task Force still does. Cochrane says no. The Cochrane Collaboration, they say no. Let's see, the bowels. How about the bowels? How about looking for colon cancer? Well, gastroenterologists say you should have a colonoscopy just as often as you please. But my recommendations are to not have a colonoscopy, so how should you check bowel cancer for bowel cancer and maybe prevent death from colon cancer? Well, my recommendation, just to kind of summarize, is that you should have one bowel check around age 60. I mean, considering you're healthy. We're talking about healthy people. So you have your bowels checked at age 60. You have a choice. You can get a stool exam. There's a new genetic test out. It's called Cologar. You can check for blood, that's okay. That gives you equal benefits as having a colonoscopy. Or you could have a sigmoid exam, or you could have stool checked for blood, genetic changes, a sigmoid, but I don't recommend a colonoscopy. Why don't I recommend a colonoscopy? <clears throat> well, because when you decide on having a colonoscopy, what you're deciding is that you're going to risk your life today. Colonoscopies, they sometimes perforate the ball and people die. You're gonna risk your life today 
for the theoretical possibility that you may avoid colon cancer in 10, 20, or 30 years. Are you willing to do that? Any type of early screening, early detection tests that you agree to do, you are saying that you're willing to risk your health, your mental sanity, your emotional well-being, and your physical health. You're going to risk it today with a digital <laughs> rectal exam, a PSA test, a colon exam, a mammogram exam. You're willing to put yourself at risk today for the theoretical benefit, and it is, it is theoretical benefit, that you're going to avoid breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer in some distant future. So what I generally recommend? Well, let's see. One stool check around age uh, 60. I do recommend pap smears. I probably should change that recommendation, but I still do. I still recommend pap smears for sexually active women, say between the ages of 21, 28, and probably 50. And you do it, general recommendations every three to five years, that'd probably be okay. If you go to the dentist, uh, if the dentist finds anything in your mouth, precancerous like leukoplakia, that's okay. That's all right. But you shouldn't actively look for uh, oral cancer. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says don't do that. They also say don't screen for skin cancer, but if you're kind of just checking around, looking in the mirror and so on, if you find something, bring it to the attention. It's different to actively screen than to just casually find. As we've discussed this weekend, you're worried about breast cancer, how should you detect it? Well, maybe you're in the shower, you're just washing yourself, you feel a lot. That's enough. You get more aggressive than that, you're going to do more harm than good. So early detection really isn't early detection, it's late detection. Let me explain to you why current cancer prevention screening techniques don't work and why treatment doesn't work. Just, just give me a minute and let me uh, tell you what's going on so that uh, you understand the urgency to think differently. <clears throat> cancer begins as a single cell in the breast, prostate, colon, a single cell that uh, stops acting normally. It becomes malignant. And one of the characteristics of malignancy is it starts doubling its own free will. In general, cells aren't allowed to double at their own free will. If the cells in your body doubled at their own free will, you'd be a misshapen mass in a matter of a couple of days. The cells are allowed to double when you grow as little children. Or if you injure yourself, the, the wound can heal and cells can double. Otherwise, cells must not double. But cells get injured by cigarette smoking, dietary changes, radiation, etc., and they stop obeying the rules. And so you start with the first cell in the breast or prostate or colon or brain, etc., wherever it is, and that first cell becomes malignant and it doubles at an average doubling time of every 100 days. So if you just take a look at the chart, the, the, the picture I have up here, you start with one cell that becomes cancerous, malignant, etc., one cell in a breast and a single breast contains 100 billion cells. Prostate, 100 billion cells. So you've got one cell that becomes cancerous, and it's confined to the breast or prostate, and then it doubles. It takes 100 days to double on average, three and a half months. So after three and a half months of having cancer, you've got two cells in a breast that contains 100 billion cells. And then it doubles, and then it doubles. And finally, you're at a year of having cancer, and you've now got about 12 cells lurking in a breast that contains 100 billion cells. It's not detectable. And the double ones continue. You go from 12, 24, 64, 100 cells, and so on. They just keep doubling. And now after, say, having cancer in the breast, prostate, or colon, after having it for, say, two years, you've got 100 cells in a breast that contains 100 billion cells. You can't find that. You could send a team of pathologists looking for that. You couldn't find that in the prostate or the breast. Yeah, you've had cancer for two years. At these early stages, if it's really cancer, and a lot of what's diagnosed as cancer really isn't, <clears throat> but if it's really cancer, what happens is these cells, they will break into the venous system. They'll go into the lymphatics too, but they break into the veins these cells do from that little tiny tumor mass. A hundred cells amongst a hundred billion cells. And it breaks into the vein system, and it spreads throughout the rest of the body to the liver, the lungs, the bones. That's called metastasis. And the spread of cancer to the brain, liver, lungs, bones is what kills. 
That happens in the early stages of cancer far earlier than anybody could ever detect. The doublings continue. On average, it takes six years <clears throat> before you've grown a tumor mass the size of a period on a paper, the size of the lead tip of a pencil. You get a tumor in your prostate, breast, or colon that's been growing on average for six years. Undetectable. And if it's really cancer, and as I say, a lot of what's detected is not really cancer. If it's really cancer, it's already spread. So the doublings continue. And finally, you've got a tumor mass the size of an eraser of a pencil. You've had cancer for 10 years. It's now detectable. It's a centimeter in size. It is now big enough to elevate the PSA test. It's been growing for 10 years. It's now big enough to find, if you're checking your breasts, somebody checks your prostate. It's finally big enough to find. It's 10 years old. Early detection is a misnomer. It's late detection. That's why early detection doesn't work. So when you understand this natural history, then you understand why all these efforts, well-intentioned, can't possibly work. All right. <clears throat> so that's the natural history of cancer. That's why we're losing the war on cancer. Remember Nixon said we were going to win the war on cancer. We're losing the war on cancer. The current uh, cancer statistics released by the American Cancer Society in uh, January 2015, they show we're losing the war on cancer. 40 years ago, the death rate from cancer for men and women is about the same as it is today. We're making no progress. The American Cancer Society knows that. Oncologists know that. Surgeons know that. Everybody knows that. But we want to believe different, don't we? But it's not true. There are improvements, by the way. I, I want to be, uh, be honest about this and, and make sure that you realize I'm not exaggerating or you know, putting things out of perspective. We have made some progress in terms of cancer treatment. I've been in this business for, what did I tell you, a long time, since 1968. And in those years, we have made some progress in terms of testicular cancer, uh, lymphomas, leukemias, childhood cancers, we made some progress. That represents maybe 4% of cancers. At best, 10%, 10%, I'll say we've made a difference in. You can't declare victory in terms of cancer because you've helped a few cancers. And the American Cancer Society knows this, and you ought to know this too. Treatment can't work, early detection can't work for the vast majority of cancers. Face it. So what do you do? How about food? Is it possible that food has a, an effect on cancer? That's what I want to address for you in the next few minutes. Is it possible that food's important? I went to medical school. My son finished medical school maybe eight years ago. There are medical doctors in here. Did they ever mention food in medical school? Probably not. Back then when I was trained, 1968 to 1972, it wasn't even brought up in four years of education. I teach medical students. I am a, a clinical professor at three medical schools, believe it or not. I see the students all the time. They're amazed that diet has anything to do with disease. It is a non-topic still, as it always has been in the past. But does that make sense? I mean, food is our most intimate contact with our environment. If you're looking at disease that varies in terms of environment, we've talked about that a lot this, uh, this past weekend, <clears throat> is that the incidence of disease varies in different countries in different times. If you believe that to be true, then you must look at the environment in terms of the incidence of disease and the progress of disease. And the environment, ladies and gentlemen, is the food. The food is the most intimate contact you have with your environment. Sure, you contact it with air. What's that? A little oxygen, a little nitrogen, a little carbon dioxide, a few pollutants. How much? You contact the environment with water. What's that, H2O, and a little few contaminants. And then consider you contact the environment with your food 
which involves tens of thousands of different substances in quantities vastly greater than your contact with water and air. It's the food. Why would you look otherwise? It's so obvious, but it's completely ignored. <clears throat> in terms of uh, cancer and diet, attention began in about 1969 when uh, a Dr. Dahl reported his findings in the British Medical Journal about the distribution of cancers worldwide. 1969. Let's just talk about breast cancer for a minute. Back in 1975, they published the following. They published country by country the incidence of breast cancer worldwide in relation to various, well, let's just talk about it, food, in relation to various factors in food. Because food is what it's all about. Didn't we decide that? So data was published in 1975. What's that, 40 years ago? Yeah, math is okay. Okay, 40 years ago. And what they found was a direct very positive correlation between the consumption of total fat and breast cancer. I could show you the same graph in terms of prostate cancer, colon cancer, all kinds of cancers, 40 years ago. Now in that same research, not only did they find a positive correlation between total fat, country by country, just take a minute, look at the countries. Rich countries, high fat intake, high risk of breast cancer. The uh, underdeveloped poorer countries, Asia, Latin America, and so on, where they didn't eat the rich Western diet, low incidence of breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, lymphomas, et cetera. This, is all, this has all been known since I've been a medical student. Well, further analysis of this, of this uh, particular geographic data, looked at the correlation between animal fat, not just total fat, but animal fat, and the uh, risk of getting breast cancer, the incidence of breast cancer in various countries. This is irrefutable data. This is fact. This hasn't changed in 40 years. The more animals you eat, the more breast, colon, prostate cancer, lymphoma, etc. Now they also looked at vegetable fat intake, and vegetable fat intake back then, well right now you might think of vegetable fat intake as uh, olive oil, corn oil, safflower oil. But what they were really looking at was uh, vegetable food intake, and they found you know, virtually no correlation. So 40 years ago, researchers knew, and they still know now, nothing's changed, that the chance of getting breast, colon, prostate cancer, et cetera, was related to your total fat intake, your animal fat intake, but not related to how much plant food you ate. Well, it's animal experiments. They were done, they actually started in the 1920s. This is by Tannenbaum. Uh, Tannenbaum was one of the earlier investigators and he published his work in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. The basic research, why not go back to the basic research? I mean, that's where it all starts. Tannenbaum, in his experiments on animals, showed that if you feed animals fat, then they grow all kinds of different cancers very rapidly. This is established fact. And then a, a, a contemporary of mine, so to speak, a little bit older, a guy named Kenneth Carroll. He published some research, this is 1979, really important. Again, nothing's changed. There's no new research that says otherwise. It's just, it's just been forgotten. Kenneth Carroll, he did experiments, and these again were on animals, and animals are relevant. Sorry. You know, uh, some of you uh, feel very strongly against animal experimentation. Too bad. Kenneth Carroll, he found that polyunsaturated fats, these are vegetable fats, more strongly influence the growth of cancer than animal fats did. Yeah. And so he did experiments on uh, various kinds of uh, animals, in this case on rats, and he fed them, a, fed them a little bit of vegetable oil, say 3% safflower oil. Didn't grow very many tumors. Fed them a uh, little coconut oil, not very much tumors. Fed them lard, tallow, animal fat. Not too many tumors, those are the first three bars. So a 20% diet of animal fat didn't promote growth of tumors very much. And then what Carroll did is not, he didn't develop animal fat, but he added just a tiny bit of vegetable fat. 
And that's your fourth bar there. Look what happened to tumor growth. See, Kenneth Carroll knew, and investigators should know, and the truth is that uh, fat promotes cancer, but health food vegetable fat is even more tumor promoting than is animal fat. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Kenneth Carroll published this in 1979. He looked at tumor growth in various uh, in, in animals, and he looked at the effect of uh, sunflower oil and cottonseed oil. And, excuse me, the third bar is olive oil. You can grow great tumors with olive oil. Yes, you can. Don't kid yourself. These vegetable fats are very, very cancer promoting. Now, what I'm talking about here, I'm not talking about the vegetable fat, the 4% fat that's in beans or the 5% fat that's in rice, or the 1% fat that's in potatoes. I'm talking about uh, a bottle of health food olive oil or safflower oil or corn oil. That's what we're talking about here. So we've known for 30, 40, 50 years that fat promotes cancer, vegetable fat promotes cancer growth and number of cancers even more effectively than does animal fat. And that's what the truth is. All right. Animal experiments done over the years show that if you take cholesterol, where does cholesterol come from? Cholesterol is synonymous with animal food. Cholesterol is found in eggs, dairy, chicken, fish, beef, pork. Virtually no cholesterol in any vegetable food at all. So what they showed back a long time ago, what this is, is in 1982, they showed in animal experiments, if you took cholesterol out of the animal's diet, the animal lived longer and you retarded the growth of the cancer. The research is consistent. You can change the incidence and the growth of cancer by changing the diet. I was a young doctor when I learned all this. Dr. T. Colin Campbell, we've had him here on stage, you know who he is. One of the things he talks about is how animal protein turns cancer genes on and off and promotes cancer growth that he believes, I'm not here to justify it, but he believes if you take animal protein out of the diet of people with cancer, you'll change the course of the disease. So I want you to just hear a common theme. And that is that eating fat promotes cancer. Eating animal foods promotes cancer. Eating a natural plant food based diet with no added vegetable oils is the way that you prevent cancer and, which is what I'm here to talk to you about, the way you change the course of this disease. <clears throat> Back in 1979, I don't even, I'm not even let's see, how old was I? I was pretty young. I was born in 1947, do the math. In 1979, uh, they, uh, I was in Hawaii, and we were on a committee on, in Hawaii, 1979, a committee to decide what people in Hawaii should do in terms of the, 1979, what people should do in Hawaii to change their chance of getting cancer, all kinds, breast, colon, prostate cancer. And in 1979, what we decided is you should eat a low animal food diet, a high plant food diet. In 1979, in Hawaii. Now, they got mad at us when we, uh, we I, I was part of this committee. In fact, you can imagine I was part of this committee. Uh, they got mad at the National, the National uh, Cancer Institute, the national organization got mad at us because we were so bold as to submit dietary recommendations in 1979 for the people of Hawaii, which is where I live, to help people prevent cancer in 1979, and they told us so. The Hawaii Division of the Cancer Society was told to stop doing this. Nationally, we have our own guidelines, and in 1979, uh, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines on Cancer and Diet were, were, were published. So we knew this in 1979, that diet influenced the incidence of cancer. It's common knowledge in 1980. Large papers. I have, I have a file cabinet at home with papers on uh, cancer, diet, and so on. It's a big file cabinet. It's consistent. The research, uh, well published, well established before 1980. The diet is, an, is, is let's just say, it, is the primary factor in the cause of our common cancers, breast, colon, prostate, body of the uterus, and so on. Long time, about 35 years, we've done that. Okay, the US Dietary Guidelines on Diet and Cancer were published in 1982. Old information, I just want to establish for you the fact that this information is abundant, well-known, but forgotten. <clears throat> Let me tell you about uh, one of my mentors. 
His name was Ernst Winder. Mary remembers Ernst Winder. This was uh, probably uh, 1980 that Ernst Winder and I met. Ernst Winder, he was, uh, he was the founder of the American Health Foundation, a big foundation in New York where they studied diet and cancer. A whole, whole team of scientists that they uh, worked together to study diet and cancer. And Ernst Winder, let me tell you a little bit about Ernst Winder, because I knew this man. Believe me, I rest on the shoulders of some very important people. Ernst Winter and I, I remember we had breakfast together one day in Seattle, Washington, and we're sitting and talking, and he says to me, he says, you know, John, he says, uh, back in the 1950s, I went to Sloan Kettering University, Sloan Kettering, Sloan Kettering Institute. So I went to, Ernst Winter's telling me that we're over breakfast. He says, you know, I went to Sloan Kettering back in the 19, he's the guy that's discovered the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, Ernst Winter did. That's how important he was. So we're sitting at breakfast, and Ernst says to me, he says, you know, he said, uh, I went to Sloan Kettering Institute back in the 1950s to all the experts and the cancer experts. I went to him and I said, you know, he says, I think smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer. And he says, those people at Sloan Kettering, they looked at me and they said, you got to be kidding. You, why would you think that? Well, Ernst says you take this tube of tobacco, you put it in your mouth, and you go, and you get lung cancer. Nah, you gotta be kidding. Back in the 1950s. And Ernst and I were having breakfast together. And he says, you know, John, he says, I went in the 1960s, I went back to Sloan Kettering, and I said, what you put in your intestine causes colon cancer. And they said, nah, you gotta be kidding me. Can you believe that? That what you put in your intestine causes colon cancer. Well, Ernst Winter did that. Yes, he did. Ernst Winter did something else that kind of opened my eyes. Is Ernst Winter did international studies on people who got breast cancer. And what Ernst found is he found that uh, women who lived in Japan, very few got breast cancer. But those who got breast cancer who lived in Japan lived much long, with breast cancer, lived much longer than women in the United States who got breast cancer. So Ernst Winter believed back in the 1960s and 70s, that even after you got cancer, how long you lived, how well you lived, how fast your cancer grew, depended upon what you ate. Yeah. That only makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, why would you throw gasoline on a fire? If uh, every medical organization Every health organization in the world believed in the 1970s, they knew this. I showed you the papers. All consistent. The research is totally consistent. If they believed that cancer of the breast, colon, and prostate were caused by the rich Western diet full of meat and dairy, lacking in vegetables and starch, if they believed that in the 1970s and 80s, would it be a big step to believe that people who already have cancer what they eat makes a difference. There, there, were, uh, there have been a, a few studies published. They're kind of interesting. Let me just uh, stop for a minute and tell you about this. There, there have been studies done that show that cigarette smokers who get lung cancer, you believe, don't you, because you're non-smokers, that cigarettes cause lung cancer. There have been studies done, multiple studies in, published in multiple journals that say the following. They say that people who quit smoking when they find out they have lung cancer before, who quit smoking, live almost twice as long as the fools who continue to, to smoke. Can you believe that? Okay, so if you can believe that, you could probably believe, if you believe diet causes colon cancer, which you put in your colon, diet causes breast cancer, which is you know, pretty consistent data. If you believe diet causes prostate cancer, would it be a big stretch to suggest that once you get cancer, you ought to change your diet. That is a big stretch for a lot of people. It really is. Cancer. Is that a irreversible disease? People believe so. So do the doctors. You go to the doctor with a diagnosis of cancer, and pretty much it's, uh, you're given a death sentence. There's nothing you can do. Can't be healed, chain cancer, of course. The treatments don't work. I just showed you the cancer, the, uh, the Cancer Society's statistics on cancer, they, they plain and simple don't work for the majority of cancers. So you're given a death sentence, you're never getting any advice about eating a good diet. Is that true? Can we change the course of cancer? 
Well, in 1984, the first study ever published on the dietary treatment of cancer was published in the journal Breast. I did that study. I, uh, back when I was living in Hawaii, in the early 1980s, I told you in 1979, I was involved in, in the committee recommendations on how people in Hawaii ought to prevent cancer. Well, I got so bold back in the late 70s and early 80s as to ask for research money to do a study on whether or not women who already had breast cancer could change their future. <clears throat> got a little money, did a tiny study, published in an obscure journal. But what I showed, and what was published in 19, the first study ever published, on the treatment of breast cancer with diet, 1984. What I showed is that if women changed their diet, they would change all the prognostic factors related to breast cancer. In other words, if you get breast cancer, if you're fat, you're gonna die sooner. Unquestionable. If you have high cholesterol, you're gonna die sooner. If you have high estrogen in your blood, high prolactin in your blood. In other words, if you have evidence that you eat the rich Western diet because you're too fat, high cholesterol and so on, you're gonna die faster. I showed in 1984 that by, you, I know you believe this because you've seen it happen in your life, that you could change all these prognostic factors. And I thought it would get people's attention, but it didn't much. Maybe it did, maybe it did, maybe it got people's attention. Because uh, these days, there are studies published, and I'm going to show you a few of these. There are studies published in our major medical journals, consistently published, that show that if you go on a high plant food, low fat diet, you will change the survival time of people who have, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about preventing cancer, I'm talking about people who have cancer, you will change how long they live, published in major, you will change how long people with breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, even melanoma, how long they will live if they change their diet. That's current knowledge. Let me just show you diet and survival of breast cancer. Major review. Just published. Showing that if you change your diet, women who eat healthy survive longer with breast cancer. 2013. Journal of the Natural Cancer Institute. Again, a high dairy fat diet. If people eat a high dairy fat diet, women with breast cancer will die faster. Published in the Journal of the Natural Cancer Institute. Prostate cancer. Multiple studies, you can read them. There are dozens of studies that show that men who get prostate cancer, if they eat half of the healthy, they'll live longer. Colon cancer, same thing. Multiple studies. Colon cancer, multiple studies showing that people who eat healthy who have cancer, they'll live longer. Melanoma, even melanoma, you know, that's, the, that's the fatal skin cancer. If you change your diet, if you eat healthy, you'll live longer with melanoma. This is uh, consistent. Even lung cancer, if you eat healthy, well, excuse me, lung cancer, that's caused by cigarette smoking. Well, not entirely. Entirely, Ernst Winder, he published what he saw. Remember, this is a major player in, in terms of health and cancer and diet, Ernst Winder. He found in Japan, back in the 1970s and 80s, in Japan, about 60% of the males smoked. And they got lung cancer. Men in the U.S., they smoked, they got lung cancer. But you know, the men in Japan who got lung cancer lived much longer than men in the U.S. who got lung cancer. Now, why would that happen? What does that make sense? Well, what Ernst Winder told me, he says, look, John, he says, you smoke cigarettes, and they do damage to the lungs, and your body tries to defend itself and heal itself, and men in Japan who eat a diet of rice and vegetables, very little meat and virtually no dairy, they're stronger, they're able to defend and heal much better than people in the US because of the diet. So you even take a, a, a cancer uh, so seemingly unrelated to diet as lung cancer caused by cigarette smoking, if you eat a healthy diet, you live longer. 
that's what the research is. And how about skin cancer? Oh, skin cancer from the sun. You know, how the sun damages the skin, gives you skin cancer. How in the world would diet be related to that? Well, the New England Journal of Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study in 1994 that showed that people who got precancerous changes called actinic keratosis, if they ate the kind of diet that we're trying to, 1994, the New England Journal of Medicine, if they ate a healthy diet, they have led, had somewhere between half and one-sixth the chance of recurrence of their precancerous lesions due to diet. So what I'm kind of trying to summarize and tell you is even all cancers, all health, all issues, the foundation is your basic health, which is determined by what you eat. It's not just colon cancer, where you put bad food in your colon. You know, how does the prostate? It's all tied in. It has to do with your, your health and your ability to heal and defend. And Good grief. It's gotten to the point where I had to talk about this because uh, February 13, 2015, the American Cancer Society, excuse me, what is that? February, th what is, one month ago, one month ago, the American Cancer Society came out with an official recommendation that the foundation of cancer therapy should be a good diet. Yes, they did. 41 years after I published the first study. That is now official recommendations, ladies and gentlemen, even up to date. Medical students, medical doctors, they always go to up to date. Up to date. Up to date now says the foundation of cancer therapy should involve a healthy diet. Amazing what can happen in four decades, isn't it? <laughs> that is now current recommendation. So you go to the doctor, and I'm, not, I'm a doctor. You know, I'm just a general doctor. You've heard me say uh, some concerning things about my colleagues. Let me qualify here because I get enthused. You know, I, I, I know there are lots of good doctors and lots of good treatments that are really a but by and large, what I'm saying is true. You get prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. Even today, I bet if you walked out of this room and you went to a doctor and you said, what should I do? What you'd be told is surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, but the American Cancer Society just published that this doesn't work for common cancers. But that's all you're going to hear. And uh, you're going to wait for your doctor to say, and you should change your diet and become healthier. You will not hear that. Maybe tomorrow you will, but not today. But you should. It's now official recommendations that people who have cancer need to eat a healthy diet. What's a healthy diet? Everybody agrees. More plants, less animals. So that's where, we, that's where we've come in 40 years. It's now current recommendations. As far as I'm concerned, any patient with cancer who goes to a doctor and listens to their advice and they fail to give dietary advice is committing malpractice and all to be held accountable. Yes, I think that. It's like if I went to a doctor, well, just to say bypass surgery worked, which it doesn't, but we won't get into that. Say I went to a doctor with coronary artery disease and the doctor failed to recommend heart surgery, I bet that'd be grounds for a legal suit, malpractice suit, don't you think? Well, I think I clearly believe that if you have cancer and you go to a doctor, or pretty much anything, but say cancer, you go to a doctor and the doctor fails to mention the importance of diet, that's malpractice. Yes, it is. Okay, I think I may have a point. Uh, there are all kinds of, there, there are all kinds of changes, mechanisms that are involved, that are known and published in the research. You can go to my last newsletter, which is a February 2015 newsletter. You don't even have to look up the references, thank goodness, to links. And you just hit any of these links and you will see consistently the research says that you can change the growth of cancer by losing weight, cutting out meat, stopping cow's milk, Stopping animal foods which stimulate cancer growth. Stopping vegetable oils. Get rid of pollutants in your diet, which already been mentioned come from the animal foods you eat. And it's all there, all the research there. It's all consistent, all clear. It's just that it's not part of the business. So what I'm talking about is not the Mediterranean diet. That's what you're hearing about is the Mediterranean diet. This is, the Mediterranean diet is, uh, what is the Mediterranean diet? Let's see, it depends on what part of the Mediterranean you're done from. Greece, Spain. What is the Mediterranean diet? Well, I know what it is. It's eat more olive oil and more nuts. Well, no, it's really not. The Mediterranean diet is healthy 
in spite of the nuts and olive oil. It's healthy because it's a starch-based diet with vegetables and fruits. And there has been research published, and I refer you to this article, that really talks about a healthy diet. It's not the Mediterranean diet. It's the Japanese diet. It's the Chinese diet before 1980. It's the diet that they used to eat in India before they came rich. That's a diet of starches, vegetables, and fruits. That's the diet that people should be teaching. But they're not. They're teaching a Mediterranean diet because that's too much for you to do a really healthy diet. OK. So anyway, hopefully I've made a couple points so far. One is that we know the cause of cancer. I mean, there are lots of causes of cancer. We know one of the basic causes of cancer that's, that's uh, almost completely ignored, which we've known for 40, 50, 70, 80 years, and that's the food. The second part I hope I've made so far is that even if you have had the misfortune of being diagnosed with melanoma, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, you still need to change your diet. Up to date, the American Cancer Society officially say that a fundamental part of your therapy needs to be a healthy diet. I hope I've made myself clear so far. Now, the problem I deal with is that people, uh, I see, I'm a doctor, I see people, I see people who have lost hope. I see people with cancer all over their bodies, their brains, their lungs, their livers, and so on. And uh, that's pretty bad, that's serious. But is it hopeless? I don't know, I don't think it's hopeless. I don't think we should stop trying. I think we could do, I do think we should do something. I mean, uh, back in, uh, 1996, there was a, a large review published uh, about people, there have been several of them, by the way, I'm just showing you one, about people who had cancer all over their body, melanoma cancer, uh, neuroblastomas, prostate cancer, breast cancer, all over their body. And what happened is it just went away. It's called spontaneous regression, spontaneous regression. Ah, uh, here's the mechanism of spontaneous regression. You want to read about this. It's published uh, about how people with cancer, every, hopeless, totally hopeless. They've been through everything. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, we don't have to go over that again. They're, just to, they're dying, they're, they, they, they say everything hopeless. But they come to see me, or you, who know about good food, you say, well, you know what? Maybe it's not hopeless. You know, there are people who this completely disappears. It's considered rare, but if you're going to have a cancer completely disappear, I think it's more likely to occur in a healthy person than a sick person, don't you think? And the only way I know to get healthy is to fix the problem. The problem is the food. All right. So spontaneous regression. It's been written about all nobody ever talks about. This is 1974, spontaneous regression. Uh, here's an here's a pub, a article published in JAMA, a case study, in 1979 of a woman with breast cancer in her lungs and all over her body. Just went away. And uh, uh, colon cancer all over the body. This was published in, well, I don't know, JAMA or yeah, Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, all over their body, all, every place that just went away. Well, you say, uh, <coughs> you say, well, <laughs> this is rare unusual and no it's not and you have met the man who did this research yesterday he didn't talk about it we were so busy talking about so many other things that his name is H. Gilbert Welch along with Zal and some other people what they did is they looked at spontaneous regression of breast cancer based on mammograms I wish we'd have had time for Dr. H. Gilbert Welch to talk about this there's so many things to discuss. But let me just take a minute and tell you what he did. You met him, one of the most important people in medicine today. You met him. And he published at least two studies and many more about spontaneous regression. Now, what does his research show? 22% of invasive breast cancers disappear over a six year period of time on their own. We're not talking about diet, they just go away. Yeah. Now, how many people talk about this? Now, we're, talking, we're not talking about diet. We're just talking about they just completely go away. 
These are invasive breast cancers. These are not carcinoma situs. These are invasive breast cancers in women. If you don't go busy looking for it, you don't go busy treating it, based on mammogram studies, H. Gilbert Welch and his colleagues showed that 20%, 22% just go away. So what happens more often than people talk about, all right. So let's see, I made the following points. I made that we do know the cause of common cancers, it's the food. And even if you get cancer, it makes only good sense to fix the cause. Costs you nothing. In fact, cut your food bill by 40%, has no adverse effects, gives you a good bowel movement, and prevents you from seeing heart surgeons. I made that point out. And I also told you, even when the body's full of cancer or has localized a real cancer, it goes away. The body's always healing. Your body is always healing. Here's one of my, some of you know her, she's one of my original breast cancer patients, uh, participants back in, we published in 1984, her name's Ruth Heydrich. We just spent, uh, some of you know Ruth, right? Sure you do, sure you do. Uh, Ruth and Mary and I and Bob, and we're all together two months ago in Hawaii. Ruth came to me, and I'm just gonna tell you some just some general stories, okay? The data is there. Nobody's going to criticize what I had to say. This is not controversial. It's solidly backed. This is common knowledge. The American Cancer Society, up to date, have already ruled on this. To think otherwise is foolhardy. It's malpractice. So let me just tell you just, just a, a couple of experiences I've had. And I say this... Uh, with honesty and enthusiasm, I believe this is what happens. Ruth Heydrich, one of my original participants in the breast cancer, first study ever published on diet and breast cancer in 1984. Ruth came to me, 1982. She walked into my office and she says, John, well, she probably called me Dr. McDougal, but whatever. She says, uh, I got good news and I got bad news. She was a marathon runner at that time. She says, the good news is I just got rid of a bad husband after 12 years. I said, well, that's good, Ruth. She says, the bad news is I've got a metastatic breast cancer. Okay. You know, this is uh, 1982. And I said, Ruth, you know, I've been working with the research and the Hawaii Cancer Society and the American Cancer Society knows the diet causes breast cancer. And you know, I said, Ruth, look, you got cancer big cancer, subsequently found to be in the bones and lungs. I said, uh, it only makes sense to change your diet, Ruth, and I, I can't say much more because I'd consider, uh, remember this 40 years ago, I'd consider it to be uh, strange, quack, whatever, whatever. You know, I, I guess I didn't really care, but anyways, I said that uh, I think you ought to change your, your diet, and I have this file cabinet full of research that I'd collect. I showed you some of that research. You notice those were yeah, I said, just read this, and what it says is diet causes cancer, and uh, Kenneth Carroll's work and Tannenbaum's work, et cetera, shows that you can uh, uh, cause cancer to progress with a bad diet, and you can slow the progression with a good diet. And she says, what do I got to lose? I'm dying. So she changed her diet. It was 1982. She has won uh, more than 1,000 medals in triathlon and marathon running. She's 82 years old. We got together in January, she's, anyway, she did well. So I've seen a lot of people have done well over the years. This lady, recent, recent, recent patient, she came, she came to me, her friend sent her to our program. She had invasive cancer, very sick. So you know who Jessica Bowen. She's very vocal about this. They'd done everything. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, you name it, she got the kitchen sink. And she was dying. So she came and asked whether I thought it was reasonable to help. And I said, yeah, I, I think we can help you. I, I know we can help you. I mean, if I was talking to her today, I'd say the American Cancer Society up to date say that we can help you. This is common knowledge. So anyways, I said, you know, I think, I think you should change your diet. That's why she came to the 10-day program. You, by the way, you don't have to come to the 10-day program. This is all free. So she changed her diet. And uh, anyway, slight improvement. 
My son, Craig, who was here, we were at a meeting in uh, Portland about a year ago, and Jessica walked up to us. Uh, she, was, she was at this meeting, and she says, he said, uh, he's a, a man, just like I am. He goes to me, Dad. He says, look at that woman. She's gorgeous. I said, yeah, you know who that is? I said, uh, that's who that is. She says, oh, my goodness. She's, that's what I said. Well, you know, we're men. And we notice things like that. <laughs> anyway. I, I wrote Jessica just a couple days ago. I said, how you doing? She says, I'm doing great. And every place I go, I tell people I'm a ca cancer survival. Maybe, maybe she's not completely cured. But why shouldn't every doctor give their patients this advantage? What is going on? Cancer, heart disease, we know obesity, constipation, and what is going on? Okay, anyway, just, uh, just wanted to kind of end on one thing because uh, some of you are thinking, okay, okay, uh, you convinced me of the evidence, or if I haven't, you go read it yourself. It's all there. This is, this is no controversy. Uh, you've convinced me, Dr. McDougall, but you know, that's a lot to ask a person to do, to change their diet. Well, what are we asking people to do right now? Let's just take breast cancer for a minute. What are we asking women to do to maybe, and I really do mean maybe, live a few days longer? Maybe. Let's give it an advantage, a few days longer. What do we ask women to do? What do we ask you to do, you to do, and you to do? What do we ask you to do? And by the way, we could be gender nonspecific, or we could change this to prostate cancer. Et cetera. What do we ask people to do? Well, we ask, uh, we ask you to get annual mammograms. Cochrane doesn't anymore. They tell you to not get them. And I'll bet you within the next three years, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says stop getting mammograms, as they've said, for PSA testing and breast self-examination. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force tells you not to do this. But common practice is you get an mam annual mammogram just a little longer. And uh, you check your breasts. Every day, every week, every month, you're constantly looking for something. It causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. And then what we ask you to do is ask you, and, and again, I'm being general, we ask you to go see a male doctor, take your shirt off, and let him check your breasts. Yes, we do. You do it. And then if we find something suspicious, and believe me, if we find something suspicious, we're going to look into it, because the number one reason doctors get sued is because of misdiagnosis of breast cancer. So you bet your you-know-what that I'm not going to miss it if I'm a doctor. So we get your biopsy. Sure, we will. And then we find something, we'll take that out. That's what we find. Well, let's see. We used to take all the breast off. It's called a mastectomy. So we'll take your breast off, and these days we'll cut part of your breast out and then give you full dose radiation and change the uh, configuration and the appearance of your breast and increase your risk of heart diseases on the left side. We'll do that for you. Yes, we will. That's what you're willing to do. And uh, we'll take your lymph nodes out. We'll do that. That's what you're willing to do. That's the common th treatment. And we'll give you radiation. That is what you're going to get. I assure you, you walk into any doctor's office in the United States or Europe, any doctor's office, oh, there's always exceptions, ladies and gentlemen, but any doctor's office, you find breast cancer, you might get a mastectomy. It used to be almost all women, but now it's down to maybe 20, 30% because you can't deny the facts. You'll get the lump removed and you'll get full dose radiation. That's what you're going to get. Uh, you get no mention about food. You'll go on anti-estrogen drugs. You may have your ovaries taken out. You'll go on polychemotherapy. You'll do all those things just to maybe live a day or two longer. But to ask you to eat oatmeal or bean burritos or pasta, that's just too much to ask you to do. However, it is not only true but it is now the standard recommendations that all cancer patients should be put on a healthy diet. The Mediterranean diet? Well, okay. I think you deserve better. Yes, I do. 
What I think you deserve is you deserve to give your body, as we've talked about this whole weekend, the chance to heal, stay healthy. The problem is the food. You fix the food. I don't care what state of health you're in. You should expect to get better. That's just the way it is. I know it's not profitable. I know it's not commonly practiced. But those are the facts. And that's what we're going to deal with in the future. And uh, I just couldn't say any more except let's have a good lunch. Thank you very much. All right. And we'll be back together right after lunch. Thank you.